actually there's quite a lineup for the boat tour. Hi everyone, today is August 5, 2022. It is 4 p.m. and 24 degrees Celsius. We are here at the city sightseeing tour, boat tour ride at the harbor front. Looks like they're getting the bridge to the boat. People coming off the boat first. So there's a huge lineup now. It's a very hot and sunny day here today in Toronto. It's not that humid today, which is really good. And there's the occasional cool breeze. some other boats there's the power plant and there's a CN Tower and the Harbor Front Center stage There's an airplane in the far distance. I don't know if you guys can see it. Looks like it's taking off or landing. Looks like it's landing there. Like there's another tour, the St. Mary One. There's a lot of stuff going on here at the harbor front.
Thank you. Thank you. And here we are. And we're now boarding the boat. Let's make our way to the back so we can have a clear view. The boat feels kind of wobbly. Yeah, I'll sit over here. And one can see the lineup extending outside of the boat. And there's some more boats there in the distance. We've got a Canadian flag design on the canopy here. ride is apparently about 45 minutes and so there goes the St. Mary one I have a feeling it's gonna be a fun boat ride I just got off the city sightseeing tour bus and the bus ride that it takes you on and that was very fun and educational so I really valued it I learned a lot and that one stops at all the major and important places that one would like to see in the city There's more people getting on board. I was able to get a quick bite at Tim Hortons in that green building there before boarding the boat. I also got an extra bottle of water just in case I get thirsty or dehydrated while on board. And there's a pirate taxi returning from the Toronto Islands. That's a pretty cool boat taxi that'll take you to the Toronto Islands.
hear some more people boarding on. Yeah, I think that person there in the uniform and the white hat is going to be the captain of the boat. And over here there's also seats where one can face the side of the boat. And those are pretty cool. Maybe I'll do a, a future boat tour video from the side of the boat. For the first time I'll just do it here on the taxi just boarded some people and off it goes again towards the Toronto Islands Looks like they're going to be removing the platform to the boat and I think we're going to be leaving soon.
staff is very friendly and everyone's in a good mood today. It's a very nice day here today. Yeah, it looks like that's the last rope. Alright everyone, welcome aboard the Harbor Star Cruise. My name is Etienne, I will be your live tour for today. At the helm we have our Captain Ted and our first mate, Jen. Both fully qualified by Transport Canada to operate this vessel. The boat itself is fully Coast Guard certified. For your safety, life jackets are located at the back of the boat on the lower level, along with four life rings, two life wraps, and a VHF radio. The VHF radio is used to stay in contact with other boats in the vicinity and the Toronto Police Marine Unit, which is responsible for all the waterways within the jurisdiction of Toronto. In the event of an emergency, please remain calm and listen to the boat crew for further instructions. For your convenience, the bar and washrooms are located on the lower level. Simply use the back staircase to get to the lower level. The bar is selling a variety of snacks and beverages such as chips, beer, bottles of water, pop and iced tea. You are welcome to pay by cash, credit card, and American cash is and off we go. We'll continue our this is pretty cool. Shortly. There's the Obsidi Obsession 3 in the distance. And there's Lake Ontario. And we are moving slow and steady. This is pretty cool. Skyline and the CN Tower from the distance, and we can see the Rogers Center. Here's a look in. All right, welcome aboard, everyone. My name is Etienne. We're going to start up the commentary shortly. How are we all doing this sunny, sunny afternoon? Amazing, just so you know, we are actually at full capacity, 97 passengers on board, full house today. We're going to start off by talking about the lake that we're currently traveling on. This is Lake Ontario, one of five great lakes in North America. All the five great lakes actually represents the world's, 21% uh, of the world's fresh water. Uh, although Lake Ontario is one of the smallest in terms of surface area, being 7,320 square miles or 19,000 kilometers, it is one of the deepest, being 802 feet or 244 meters in depth. The name Ontario is thought to have originated from the First Nations indigenous people, the Iroquois people to be exact, meaning beautiful lake or sparkling water. We can actually see the sparkling water on our right-hand side. The first known use of the word Ontario by European explorers can date to as early as 1641 and appeared on maps as early as 1656. A good way to remember all the names of the Great Lakes is the acronym HOMES. H for Huron, O for Ontario, M for Michigan, E for Erie, and S for Superior. 
Oh, we have a fan of Lake Erie. Very nice. Uh, this part of the lake is actually situated in the inner harbor. And on the northern shores of the lake, the harbor is protected by the Toronto Islands and reaches a maximum of 40 feet or 12 meters. To give you a perspective of how deep that is, that's about the length of a regular city bus. More than enough for uh, regular cargo ships and ferries to operate. During the winter time, the entire inner harbor actually freezes over with thick layers of ice. This necessitates the use of special boats called icebreakers to free up the water for the ferries and cargo ships. You'll notice on our right hand side, many of the white flotation devices bobbing around in the water, those are called buoys. They are there to mark the barrier to the Billy Bishop Airport, the airport on the island. Billy Bishop Airport is considered the ninth busiest airport in Canada and welcomes approximately 2.8 million people every year. The vast majority of flights that go through this airport mainly consist of domestic and limited international flights run by both Air Canada and Porter Airlines. Uh, you'll also notice that many of the planes here operate using turboprop propeller type engines unlike the conventional jet engine system that we see for many international flights today uh, it's been quite a controversy in fact that uh, although the airport wants to use uh, jet airplanes many of the residents on the island and those on the harbor front are strongly opposed to the use of larger jet planes it also requires an extension to the runway which they're also opposed to other planes that you may find here landing at billy bishop are of the smaller type propeller planes, whether that be private or charter planes, as well as a variety of helicopters. If you uh, happen to pass by a orange colored helicopter, there aren't out any right now, but if you do see one, those are actually ambulance helicopters. They are used in areas where road access is not easily obtainable. Patients can be airlifted to either Billy Bishop or the closest hospital that has a helicopter pad. If you'd like to visit the airport or simply have a flight to catch later on, there are two good ways to get there. The first by ferry boat. This ferry boat ride is in fact one of the shortest and takes a whopping 90 seconds to get from the mainland to the airport. Alternatively, you could walk there by means of an underground tunnel underneath the water. Uh, the plans for this tunnel first emerged as early as 1935. However, construction did not start until 2012. It opened to much fanfare three years later in 2015. In terms of the name of the airport, it is Billy Bishop. You may also be asking, who is Billy Bishop and why is the airport named after him? Well, he was a veteran who participated in the First and Second World War and trained specifically out of the uh, uh, airport right here back when it was still a military training base. Uh, he was able to secure the Victoria Cross during the First World War and in the Second World War participated as a marshal securing over 72 credited victories making him the top ace Canadian fighter. We'll now shift our focus to learning about the Toronto Islands. I'll start off by asking you all a question. How many islands do you think there are that consist of the ensemble of the Toronto Islands? Any number, any guess? 12? 115? 7? Any more guesses? Okay, well if you actually guess closer to 14, you are correct. 14 is the correct number. Uh, there are 13 smaller islands clustered around a central one. We'll see the central one later on in the tour. Many of these islands did not actually start out as islands. In fact, many of them were sand dunes being carried by the strong westerly current of Lake Ontario. And then we'll see another quarter airplane just leaving the runway right now. As I was saying, uh, the sand dunes actually stretched for a total of nine kilometers at one point and also had a mainland connection in the eastern portion. 
uh, many spot repairs were made to this uh, mainline connection so that people could get there on foot. However, it took a series of uh, heavy storms in 1858 for that mainland connection to be severed. Uh, at that point, uh, they believed it was too uh, costly to repair, and so people have been going to the islands by boat ever since. Of course, as passing by the airport, you can see the many uh, features that it has the small uh, planes that are being stored in the plane hangars and the airport facility, of course. We'll also note that at times the waters can be choppy. It is high time for uh, boat season. Uh, that way um, there's plenty of uh, waves going on. Not enough to capsize the boat, thankfully. You'll also notice uh, just over here, right by the ferry port, in fact there's a ferry boat coming out right now, right here at the Hanlon's Point ferry dock. Hanlon's Point is actually named after the Hanlon's family, one of the first families to establish year-long residence here on the islands. They also built the first hotel here, uh, quickly making it the center of attraction. There's also a series of flags that are flying by the uh, boat dock over here. Three different ones, in fact. The first one is a blue flag with a white T. That is the City of Toronto flag. One of the red flags that has a British emblem and a green shield. That is the provincial flag for the province of Ontario. And the third flag, the most iconic of the three with the red maple leaf, is of course the Canadian flag. A good way to remember where the islands are located is that it is in the city of Toronto, the province of Ontario, and the country of Canada. There are many trees that can be found here on the island, but the ones that we're looking here on our right hand side are both cottonwood and willow trees. They are there to protect Toronto's one and only nude beach. It is one of two official nude beaches here in Canada and is clothing optional. Uh, it was first started up in 1999 as a pilot project and became a permanent fixture in 2002. The trees in a sense provide a visual barrier, that way there are no surprises for both uh, residents and tourists alike. If you'd like to visit the beach, simply take the Toronto Island Ferry to Hanlon's Point walk about 15 minutes on the pedestrian walkway there are plenty of signs to guide you there do i have any baseball fans here in the crowd only one oh that's okay we'll we'll, we'll talk about a few facts on that um, hanlon's point was also the site of a 10,000 seat baseball stadium uh one in where uh babe ruth hit his first professional home run in 1914 at the time, he was playing for the Providence Grays baseball team and hit the ball so far out that it flew out of the stadium and landed somewhere in the lake. There are many theories as to where this ball is. However, the one that makes the most sense is that it's somewhere chilling down deep in the water with no one to uh, pick it up just yet. You'll also notice the wide variety of boats that are in the dock right now. So we let the Oriole uh, ship pass by. We get to see. Many different types, in fact, both motorized and sailboats. These boats form part of three private yacht clubs. The first being the Island Yacht Club, established in 1951. Many of the members of the Island Yacht Club enjoy amenities such as access to 18 acres of land on a small island called Muggs Island. They also have access to tennis courts, um, swimming pools, and three dining halls. We'll see more of the other boats later on in the tour. Those also belong to the other two private yacht clubs, the Royal Canadian Yacht Club, as well as the Queen City Yacht Club.
as it turns out, the Toronto Island serves also as a pivotal location for wildlife, particularly migrant birds. Over 200 species have been observed here on the islands, and as many as 60 of those species nest here on a regular basis. The islands are often the first landfall for birds that are making the exhaustive trip across Lake Ontario. Some of the birds that you may find here can include, but are not limited to, warblers, wrens, black-crowned night herons, kingfishers, blue herons, cormorants, egrets, long-tailed ducks, buckleheads, mute swans, Canadian geese, the occasional tundra, or whistling swan. In fact, we have a poster downstairs if you'd like to look at the many varieties of birds as well as a visual reference of them all. We'll note uh, the birds that are either in the water directly in front of us or in the air, the black birds, those are actually cormorant birds. They made quite a few headlines a few years ago in the Toronto Star newspaper. Many of the residents here grew quite annoyed with these birds as when they tended to go to the washroom, they left, they left some sort of uh, acidic property killing off the leaves on some of the trees. Uh, they also tend to leave an unpleasant smell at times. On a lighter note, however, there are plenty of fish that you can find here at the Toronto Islands. Those include carp, pike, yellow perch, sunfish, rock bass, and catfish. If you like to fish, you can certainly purchase a license from the provincial government of Ontario. Other animals spotted here on the islands are that of turtles, raccoons, muskrats, beavers, deer, and even coyotes. The most posed question about the animals here on the islands uh, tends to focus on the coyotes. They ask how did they get on the island if there's no mainland connection? Well, there's three ways they could have taken. Either they swam at the closest point between the mainland and uh, the islands, they walked across the frozen inner harbor, or they simply hitched a free ride on the Toronto Island Ferry. We make our way further into the islands. The long stretch of water that we're currently traveling on, this is called the Long Pond. This is where the Dominion Day Regatta is held in the month of July. It was renamed the Allen A. Lamport Regatta in 1994. Allen A. Lamport was a former mayor for the city of Toronto who allowed the regatta to be enlarged to international dragon boat race standards. Uh, the dragon boat race festival actually began in 1989, proved to be quite popular and celebrates Chinese culture at the same time. We'll take a moment to uh, enjoy the scenery and the breeze. Uh, feel free to wave by any of the boats that pass us. Many of the people here on the island are quite friendly and they will wave back at you. If you're looking to take pictures of the city skyline, 
now would be a good time to take your phone or camera out facing our left hand side. There, there will be a opening here where the water clears another channel as well as a view of the other boats that form part of the private yacht clubs. So just as we make the clearing over here, you can start taking pictures. And if you don't get a good picture now, that's okay. There will be a second chance to do so later on in the tour. You got some good pictures. Uh, in just a few moments, we'll be making a loop around the Four Street Island. This is one of the few islands that does not have any bridge connection, making it quite isolated. There's also, just coming up on our right hand side, you'll see coming into view three radio antennas. These, in fact, broadcast in AM frequency. They are run by the CHIN Radio Broadcasting Company. The first, uh, in fact, to broadcast multilingually in channels both in French and in English. Given the growing Chinese population here in Toronto, uh, they also have channels uh, broadcasting in Mandarin and Cantonese. You still listen to the radio, uh, particularly in AM frequency, you can get a pretty good reception even from the mainland. We'll also go ahead and uh, spit a few more uh, island facts for you. The island on our right hand side, this is in fact the biggest island of the lot. That is Center Island. The island far on our left hand side, that is Middle Island. That's where the ferry boat docks and where a... Uh, many horns. Uh, that's where... Uh, the children's amusement park is. Uh, it is actually called Centerville. It was built in 1967, right around the turn of Canada's centenary year. Uh, it even features a miniature railway. Uh, more things that can be found on Center Island include a pier, includes a pier that extends out onto Lake Ontario, many bike and boat rentals, uh, a splash pool, a maze, more beaches, and plenty of open parkland. If you're looking to uh, visit the islands for an entire day, you may as well pass by the Far Enough Farm, complete with a petting zoo that has pigs, horses, goats, and the occasional peacock walking around. I'll also note that uh, the islands as a whole forms one of the largest urban car-free uh, uh, communities here in North America. That means the residents here are not allowed to have their own cars. They either have to walk or use a bicycle to get around. There are exemptions to this rule, however. Essential vehicles such as garbage trucks, fire trucks, and ambulances are permitted on the island as well as the occasional city bus as well, uh, provided for use during inclement weather, such as heavy rain or snowstorms. So we make the loop around uh, the Forestry Island. You'll also notice another clearing here. You'll see a rather large white building with skylight windows. That, in fact, is a water purification plant. It takes the water from the lake, purifies it, and makes it potable for use both on the island and for the city of Toronto. The island also hosts one school offering education from grade 1 to grade 8. 
many of the students that attend this school come from the islands and some from the mainland go there too. However, after grade eight, uh, they have to continue their education at the closest school on the mainland. On the downside, um, there are no grocery or hardware stores to be found here on the island. So if any of the residents need supplies, they'll have to take the ferry and take them all from the mainland. The clearing over here on our right hand side just shows you a glimpse of what to expect on a center and middle islands with many of the pedestrian walkways filled with plenty of trees, benches and the occasional barbecue stand. Coming up, uh, you can take out your phone or camera to take a picture of the beautiful green and white bridge coming up on our right hand side. That in fact, that bridge is called the Avenue of Bridges and has been around since 1895 being the main pedestrian bridge between Middle and Center Islands. Still looks pretty good. Many people uh, actually take pictures of it. It's very picturesque. You'll also notice the uh, viewing bleachers here. That is where the starting point of the Dragon Boat Race Festival begins. They start over here and uh, compete straight down another 1,000 meters down the long pond. Now this concludes the first half of our commentary, a time where I take a short break where you can uh, enjoy the scenes without me talking for a little bit. We'll also put on a song for you, not to worry, I won't be singing, it's just a recording of a song. Uh, it's actually a lesser known song, uh, many versions of unofficial anthems for the city of Toronto. It's actually called People's City, uh, writ partially written and performed by Tommy Ambrose in the uh, early 1970s. It talks about what to expect here in Toronto as a tourist, especially as you're, what you're doing right now. Uh, I, I encourage to, for, to, for you to uh, pay attention to the lyrics as it's, uh, it's a great description of what Toronto has to offer. So this is the kind of songs that they play on the boat.
Here's a book called Miss Kim Simpson. There's a book called Blue Fusion. It's like the sailboat. beautiful tree and some people hanging out and they're waving there's some ducks Sailboats. Hmm, here's some people on canoes. This is the second opportunity that I was talking about. Time to take your phone or camera out uh, to take a picture of the city skyline as it stands today. Please make sure that if you're taking pictures along the uh, railing, not to lean too far out. Thank you. Let's look at the skyline. Just don't drop my phone, okay? 
There's a pirate taxi in the far distance. And they go pretty fast. Nice view of the skyline. All right, everyone. We're now reaching the second half of our journey. We'll start off again with the commentary. Perhaps the most interesting part of the tour, talking about the residents here on the island. There are roughly 650 people who call the islands their home today, with 262 homes that are built on the eastern part of the island, far east in fact, on Algonquin and Ward Islands. Since the 1800s, uh, many people have enjoyed life here on the islands. Uh, first in elegant summer homes, modest cottages spread out through all 14 islands. However, in the early 1900s, the city began to limit dwellers to uh, tents in the eastern portion. By 1931, the city council uh, granted permission for many of these uh, permanent tent dwellers to construct homes on the island. A change in attitude in the early 1950s by the council saw the demolition of many of these homes as many of them are, were being left in disrepair or completely abandoned. As you can imagine, uh, this upset quite a few people who continue to live on the island. They believed that the city council was trying to uproot the community and to get rid of it altogether. Uh, and so they grew quite upset with this to the point where they continued to fight with the city council for the next 20 years until in 1993 the community formed a trust under the name of the Toronto Island Residential Community Trust. It then procured a uh, lease for the next 99 years securing their future until 2092. That's when the lease expires. This then creates an interesting real estate market. Unlike the conventional system here, uh, where uh, the sailboat's the coming up. highest bidder uh, gets uh, the home or That's the condominium cool. unit, 
Many of the homes that are sold here on the islands are sold at their reappraised price from the 1990s. That means in 2022, at a time when inflation is at an all-time high, you're paying for the price of 1990s housing. Have I convinced anyone to buy a home yet on the islands? Seems like a pretty good deal, right? Uh, you're not paying a million for a home, you're paying in the couple hundred thousands, but certainly not a million. Now, uh, with every good thing, there is a catch. Um, the houses that go up for sale here uh, are sold, of course, uh, excluding wear and tear, depreciation. Uh, the price is fixed and non-negotiable. If I somehow have convinced you to buy a home, you're going to have to put your name on a 500-person wait list. That's the amount of people waiting to buy homes here on the island. In fact, every single one of those people on the list are paying $50 every year just to keep their names on the list. That means if you really want a house, you better make sure that your kids, your grandkids, and your great-grandkids also want the house on the island. Given how long the people here have to wait to buy these homes, many of them are snatched in an instant. Uh, to give you a few numbers, between 2013 and 2014, 32 houses became available for sale and 266 people from the list applied for those homes. And they also say that it could take between 167 to 250 years for everyone on that list to be able to buy a home on the island. I think at this point I'll just settle for a house on the mainland. Now normally I'd be asking you to look on your right hand side for the ferry. However, the closest ferry is actually straight ahead of us, uh, leading towards the left hand side. That rather a big ship with the uh, black keel and uh, white in the middle. That is the Toronto Island Ferry, one of the many boats that they operate. A ticket on the Toronto Island Ferry costs about $8 and that includes your return trip. That way you don't feel stranded while on the island. Uh, the ferries run seven days a week and all year round. They drop you off at three separate locations. The first being Ward Island where the residents are in the east, the middle, uh, where Center Island and Middle Island is, and to the west, where Hamlin's Point is. Although, in the winter time, they only run to Ward's Island to serve the residents. If you'd like to catch the ferry, perhaps this evening or another day, you'll have to catch it from the main ferry terminal located at Queen's Key and Bay Street. The Jack Layton Ferry Terminal, uh, that's its proper name, uh, it is named after a former city councillor and NDP party leader who enjoyed very much the ferries and the islands that when he tragically passed away of cancer a few years ago, they renamed it in honor of him. We look at the, uh, the harbor front from left to right as it is right now with many of the buildings. Uh, if we try to imagine what it looked like 30 to 40 years ago, you'd be looking at a completely different picture. In fact, the entire harbor front used to be filled with industries, factories, and plenty of chimney stacks. Uh, it wasn't until the mid-1970s when both the federal and provincial government got together uh, to form the uh, rehabilitation of the harbor front. They believe that people should be able to enjoy walking by the water. Clearly it paid off as about 20,000 people call the harbor front their home today. If we think of uh, buildings that from the past that are significant, uh, we can look to our far right where these three gray chimney stacks are on the end of, end of the harbor. That is where some of the last large-scale industrial buildings are located. Most of them are being decommissioned at this time and demolished as the City of Toronto is building a brand new neighborhood from the ground up. Uh, they're doing it to uh, create more housing options and more shopping uh, centers as well uh, so that the city can expand and welcome even more people. They, we've actually installed two new bridges as well as the reconfiguration of the John River which feeds into Lake Ontario. Other buildings to note, 
the uh, the, in the distance right there, the beige building with the tinted green glass, that is where the uh, Queen's Key Terminal was, where many of the cargo ships would unload and load uh, most of the cargo containers. And, uh, currently, it is uh, converted to a mall, but it's still a significant building nonetheless. You'll also notice, um, again on our right hand side, seem to have taken a small detour, but that's okay. Um, the large building that has a gray roof and the walls are uh, red brick, that is where the Red Pass Sugar Company is located. Uh, they have many cargo ships parked right beside it. They unload the raw sugar, uh, process it, and uh, package them into bags of sugar. Uh, the city wants the Red Pass Sugar Company to leave the harbor front. However, the owner of the Red Pass Sugar Company is a great big fan of Toronto and doesn't see their company leaving anytime soon. Business is business as usual. We'll also see and uh, uh, the uh, tallest building on the skyline, of course, the main attraction for the city. The CN Tower, named after Canadian National Railways, as they were the one who funded most of the construction for the tower. And another plane coming just above us. As I was saying, the uh, the CN Tower, uh, Canadian National Railways, it also stood on their former railway property. The tower itself stands at a staggering 553 meters or 1,815 feet in the air. Uh, to get to the main observation deck, you'll have to take a high-speed elevator. From there, you can access the many uh, spots along the observation deck, which is a full 360 degrees of panorama windows. Some of the panels on the floor have been replaced with thick slabs of glass, so you can look directly below you as well. Uh, just underneath the main observation tower, you'll notice a rather large white ring. That is where many of the telecommunication, TV, and cell phone towers are located and enclosed away from the elements. Uh, so far, none of the buildings have surpassed the height of the observation deck, so uh, reception is very good in the downtown core. Included in the main observation deck, you'll also find a 360 degree restaurant which slowly turns in a counterclockwise fashion. That way when you sit down to order your food or maybe you're waiting for your food to be delivered to your table, you look out the window and you'll never have the same view. If you'd like to go even further up, there is a smaller observation deck closer to the section of the tower that uh, turns white. There is the sky pod. It's even higher, offering much better views. And you can even see the other side of the islands from that uh, observation deck. If you have a really strong stomach, you can also pay for about $110 to go on the edge walk. They attach you to a safety harness and you can hang off the side of the observation deck. Uh, personally, I'm incredibly afraid of heights, so I'll ne I don't ever see myself ever going on there. Even if you paid me a million dollars, I wouldn't do it. I'll take the money, but I won't do it. And uh, from where we are right now, it's harder to see, but if you look straight ahead, you'll notice the large white dome just behind the three beige apartment buildings. That is the Rogers Center. Uh, it was originally built in 1989, and is, uh, its original name is the Sky Dome. You'll notice that many Torontonians prefer to call it the Sky Dome, as it just sounds cooler than the Rogers Center. The uh, roof is actually retractable and opens up. It takes about 30 minutes to do so. Uh, letting in the sunshine and uh, the fresh air. Uh, the center itself can house up to 70,000 people in one go to watch concerts or sports uh, events going on. There's also a hotel located inside the stadium. That way if you want to watch a game live,
live, but not from a TV. You can certainly do so from the comfort of your hotel room. Simply look out the window and you're watching the game right there. The red brick building with the chimney, affectionately known as the power plant, was the main electricity power plant here on the harbor front, providing electricity to all the businesses that once stood here. You'll not also notice the rather large uh, metal uh, structure over there, the white one uh, near the dock that we once started at. That is the Harbor Front Center where many uh, free concerts are held uh, during the summertime. And I think there's actually one being set up right now. So uh, be sure to check that out uh, once we uh, arrive at the dock. During the winter time, of course, too, the Harbor Front Center building, which is just over here, the white one, also has uh, a skating rink during the winter time. So if you enjoy skating, you can certainly check that out, too. For those uh, looking to uh, take the Hop on Hop Off tour bus after this boat ride, I'll give you a visual reference in just a second. You'll be looking for the Radisson Hotel, also known as the Radisson Blue Building. If you notice straight ahead over here, the dark gray building with the blue tinted glass that says Radisson Blue. That is where stop number 17 is for the tour bus. Just like the boat, you'll have to present your paper ticket to get back on the bus. And of course the Amsterdam Brewery building and the smaller building with the green corrugated roof. That is where the Toronto Police Marine Unit is located. More than ready to uh, respond to any emergencies that take place on the waters. In just a few moments, we will be making a turnaround back to the dock, a time where the commentary ends and where I have to say goodbye to you all. I certainly hope you learned quite a few things about the Toronto Islands, as well as a new perspective on the city of Toronto. Uh, if you enjoyed this tour and would like to show your appreciation, tips are always welcome here at the thank you jar right at the front of the boat. Just know that they are completely voluntary and that all the tips are equally shared with all the members of the crew. Thank you again and enjoy the rest of your stay in our beautiful city. Also make a reminder that you stay seated until it is safe to disembark. Members of the crew will let you know when it is safe to do so. Please stay seated in the meantime. Thank you.
terms of the bus schedule, took the time to check that for you guys. Just to note, the next bus leaving stop number 17 at the Radisson Blue leaves at 5.29. The following bus after that is 5.56. Once again, the next bus leaving stop 17 is 529, and the next one after that is 556. Looks like we're coming to the end of the boat ride. They're connecting the bridge. boat tour I hope you guys enjoyed this video if you like this video please hit the like button for more videos like this please hit the subscribe button and the bell notification icon and I will see you in the next one take care And it looks like there's another lineup for the next boat tour. Thank you. Take care. Bye bye.